Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence, and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of John <clears throat> chapter 1, and I'm going to start reading at verse 35. And this is what it says. Again the next day, John was standing and two of his disciples, and he looked upon Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and beheld them following and said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi which translated means teacher, where are you staying? Pray with me. Lord, may this day of worship be one that draws our hearts to you, draws our actions to you, draws the whole of ourselves to you. Heart, soul, mind, strength. Use this day. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning I have a video that I'd like to, to show you. You're about to meet Michael. He lives fast as a self-made millionaire. You didn't have to dress up, it's all right. You're gonna photograph Michael. He's actually saved somebody's life. Michael is an ex-inmate. He's a commercial fisherman. Michael claims to be psychic. Nice to meet you. Michael's a former alcoholic. Here's your camera. I would like you to flesh out the essence of who he is. What would you like out of this? What would you like the photograph to say about you? Do you find that being a psychic impacts much on your day-to-day -day life? I can see this is emotional for you. So. <laughs> like to like get to know the person. You've only got 10 minutes, right? I think you're a guy that's put yourself out there. You're not hiding anything. My plan was to find out about whoever it was and to try and get that. And what I learned from him is he's incredibly brave. That was really intense. Pull this shirt out. Sorry. I wanted to see the nature of the person, which then present a challenge. How do you portray him as a fisherman? That's perfect. He's a self-made millionaire and sort of a little bit intimidating. I wasn't going for a beautiful, nice, perfectly lit portrait. I just want to try bring out something of who you are. I think that you just treat people like the everyday people, like everybody is. Pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Well, I hope I've got that guy's bravery on the film. So it was a very intimidating environment. So you work. Mm -hmm. I like the empty chair next to it too. Because it's, it's, it's a totally, totally different person. Yeah. Almost looks like six different people. So not everything I told you today was true. I'm not a fisherman. I am not an alcoholic. The GFC hit me hard, but I've never been a millionaire. I've never been in prison. I am a Bondi lifesaver, but the story we talked about never did happen. Not psychic. Can barely spell it. Before I knew there were different characters in each of these, I thought, that's really strange. These don't look like portraits of the character I thought you were. You always got your own preconceptions and you got your ideas. It pushed me into a, a position and a space that I wouldn't normally be in. You have to dig a lot deeper. It means you've got to be, I think you're a lot more creative to, to work out how you're going to play things. Did you 
catch that last tagline? Did you catch that last tagline? A photograph is shaped more by the person behind the camera than the one in front of it. Well, I don't think it's just photographers. I think it's all of us. The question set before us right here in the Gospel of John, what do you seek? That we'd love to believe that, well, seeing is believing, but that's not the case. It's believing is seeing. What we believe that we see very, very often, if not always, is what we end up seeing. John's disciples, they hear John the Baptist speaking, and, and he, he points, and, and he says, there's the Lamb of God. And two of John's disciples began to follow Jesus. And Jesus turns to them, the first words of Jesus in the entire Gospel of John are a question. And those questions, the question is, what do you seek? What do you seek? And a strange thing is, John's disciples don't answer it. They answer the question with a question, where are you staying? So it's the reader that's left with the question. At the beginning of the Gospel of John, chapter 1, the words of Jesus, that, that, that question, what do you seek? It, it starts the, the Gospel of John and it, it goes throughout the entire Gospel. Well, it's not just the Gospel of John. That's the question that follows us through life. Who's behind the camera? What is it that you're looking for? What is it that we expect to see? Because it's, it's that, that believing is seeing. Believing is seeing. And, and, and what we expect to see, what we seek, well... It makes a difference. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. And the first thing that I want to talk about is that it makes a difference the way that we see other people. When I was in sixth grade, we were going out to PE. A group of boys were together, and the conversation was pretty rapid. That um, Greg and Jim were going to fight. We didn't know when it was going to happen, but at about every two or three months, Greg and Jim, they threatened to fight each other. It never did happen because they were best friends. But every two or three months, they'd get a little too close to each other, and one would, would blow up. And they were ready to fight. They were ready to fight it out. Scoot back the furniture, didn't know when, didn't know where. A lot of times they pointed, after school, let's fight. Well... The conversation was, who do you think will win? Jim was a little taller. He had the reach advantage. But Greg was a little stronger. So we started, you know, guessing, who do you think would win? Well, then it quickly moved from that to, well, who is the one person that you would not fight in the sixth grade? Well, it was unanimous. Tony. Tony was by far the biggest, strongest kid in the sixth grade. Nobody would fight him. And, and then somebody went around, the questioner went around asking each of the boys as we walked out to PE, would you fight Tony? When it came to me, I said, if he hit me in the face, I would. You know, I, hitting on the arm, the leg, you know, there's some things you can forgive, but the ultimate insult would be to, hit, to be hit in the face. And guess what? As we were walking out, turned around and looked behind us, and guess who was standing right behind us? It was Tony. Nobody was really sure whether Tony heard the conversation that was going on, and everybody got real quiet. Well, that day we were playing baseball. When it was my turn to come to bat, I hit the ball into the outfield, and I tried to make a double out of what was really just a single. And as I came around first, I knew I was going to be thrown out. The second baseman was waiting to receive the ball from the outfield. I ran as hard as I could. I slid knowing that I was going to be tacked. Guess who the second baseman was? <laughs> it was Tony. He fielded the ball a long time before I slid in, and I knew I was going to be tagged out, so I just slid in. But rather than tagging me on the foot, rather than tagging me on the leg or on the pants, he tagged me in the face. And I was sure I knew why he tagged me in the face. I was sure that he was daring me to do something like, a, like the big talk that I'd given before. He, he tagged me in the face. And what I did next, I still regret 
<laughs> well, if, if people tell you they have no regrets, it's only because they have a short memory. That's the only reason there are no regrets. Ah, oh, I still regret it. I still, you know, sometimes there's those things that come out and they bite you, you know. Because my next move, I saw what was really going on. When I lit into Tony, he was as surprised as anyone. And what I saw on his face was not only surprise, but hurt feelings. That somebody that he thought was a friend would light into him for a tag, a tag on the face. Well, you know, if we're looking for enemies, we can always find them. Enemies and allies, it's about the quickest, easiest way to divide up the world. And if we're searching, if we're searching for an enemy, we can find them. Here in John chapter 18, Judas has divided up enemies and allies. Chapter 18, verse 4. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? It's the same question. They answered, Jesus the Nazarene, and he said, I am he. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. Judas was, was sure that he knew how things ought to go out, that, that there ought to be some final kind of battle, and, and, and that the power of Jesus against the power of the, the, the Roman guards and the, the temple guards would, would have a showdown there in the garden. Chapter 18, he was seeking a showdown. He was seeking a time to scoop back the furniture and let's fight it out. He had chosen enemies and allies. And he found the wrong enemy. He found the wrong enemy. We live in a time where there are voices out there calling us to seek out enemies and allies. Jesus said, Love your enemies. And he didn't give a lot of um, rebuttal after that on how to define an enemy, how to define an out. No, he just said, love your enemies. And he expects us to do the same. What do you seek? What do you seek? It makes a difference in the way that we see other people. But not only does it make a difference in the way we see other people, it makes a difference in the way that we see ourselves. A fellow went to the doctor. He was feeling like he just didn't want to work. He was feeling tired, and he was feeling bored. The doctor said he'd give him an exam and a battery of tests, and as he went through the exam, the, the doctor nodded. Every once in a while, the man would hear, mm-hmm, oh, Something like that. And at the end of the exam and the battery of tests, finally the man said, okay, doc, give it to me plain. Don't try and sugarcoat it. Don't give it some complicated scientific name. Just tell me. The doctor said, okay, you're lazy. <laughs> that wasn't quite what the man expected. So he thought for a minute. He said, okay, doc, thank you for giving it to me plain. I appreciate that a lot. But now can you give me the complicated scientific name because I need to go home and tell my wife. We all want a name that explains and a name that, that, that takes the complication out of things. A name that is for ourselves that, that lifts us a little higher. A name that, that lets others know we're well thought of. We like a name for ourselves. We like a name, a name hopefully of our choosing, but it's even better if someone chooses that name, and it's a high name for us. Well, you know the folks that Jesus had more trouble with than any other folks? It was the, those folks that were well thought of. Those folks that... Um, had a name for themselves. Those folks that were the, 
the, the people that were most esteemed. And these were the folks that Jesus had trouble with day in and day out. And in John chapter 5, verse 44, Jesus is speaking to them and he says, How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek, there's that word again, and do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? When we seek to be well thought of, when we seek a name for ourselves, when we seek the high esteem of another, we're forever forever imprisoned by what other people think. That the Bible's not so concerned that we have a positive self-image. The Bible is much more concerned with a proper self-image. That you and I are nothing more than sinners saved by grace. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. It's not some of us are higher and some of us are lower and some of us have, you know, heavyweight sins and some only have lightweight sins. No, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. It's tough to build a a positive self-image out of all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's not some have, or there's some that can still be well thought of because their sins aren't near as great as those other folks. No, that the Bible is, is clear that you and I are nothing more than sinners saved by grace. That we stand before the judge's bench and we're all on the same side. The side of the convicted, the side of the guilty. And we don't get the opportunity to go around to the other side and sit in the the seat of the judge. That we're on the side of the guilty. That it's level ground beneath the cross. But the Bible doesn't stop there. That yes, we're nothing more than sinners saved by grace, but we're nothing less, nothing less than children of God. John chapter 1 verse 12 says, but as many as received him, to them he gave power to become children of God. That when we receive the risen Christ, He begins to transform and make us into a new creation, a new creature, something we could never be on our own, something we could never be by our own works. No matter how hard we try, we can only do it when His work is done in and through us. That on the cross, what Jesus did for you and for me, He took all those things that would destroy us and He wiped them away, wiped them clean. He took away their power. And when he rose from the grave, he gave that power to you and me that we might be children. Children. Nothing more than sinners saved by grace and nothing less than children. Children of God. Well, that makes the folks around us brothers and sisters. Jesus said the truth The truth will set you free. It'll set you free from what others think. It'll set you free from the striving of making a name for ourselves, from the striving of being well thought of. What do you seek? What do you seek? Do you seek the approval of others, making a name for yourself, being well thought of? Well, It makes the difference the way that we see ourselves. What do you seek? It makes a difference the way we see ourselves. It makes a difference the way that we see others. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is that it makes a difference in the way that we see God. In chapter 6, Jesus has just fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. And after he fed the 5,000... He went to a lonely place to pray. Well, his disciples got on the Sea of Capernaum, and they went to the other side. The wind picked up on the sea, and Jesus saw that they were being tossed around by the wind. And and there in chapter 6, 
that night, Jesus walks across the water, and he, he stilled the waters, and he stilled their fears. Well, chapter 6, verse 24 says that when the multitude saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the small boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. There's that word again. They were seeking Jesus. And verse 26, this is what it said. Jesus is doing the talking. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. You seek me not because you believe that he has the power of God. Jesus is saying to you, you seek to me, seek me so that your stomachs can be filled, so that your needs will be met. We're in a real hard time right now. Don't need to tell anybody that. And so often our prayers are prayed so that we might have peace, so that we might have comfort, so that our, our worries might be stilled, so that we might have healing. Well, Jesus doesn't get on to them for seeking out because of the immediate need, but he lets them know that there's more. In verse 35, he says, I am the bread of life. That yes, we can spend our lives seeking Jesus for this need and that need and the next need, and we'll be going from crisis to crisis to crisis until times get pretty good and then we won't need him at all. But he has more. He has more for you and me than chasing crisis after crisis after crisis. What he has for you and me is life. Life that's eternal. Life that's abundant. Life that starts in the here and now and it goes on. That the quality of this life is a life that we can't get on our own. It's come, it comes when we seek Jesus as the way, as the truth, as the life. A little while back, I was eating lunch with a friend. And I was catching up with him about how things were going. And that's when he said it. He said, everywhere I go, God shows up. <laughs> I said, well, what do you mean? He said, you know, I start my day every day, he said, with a devotion. He said, and before I get to work, God shows up. <laughs> I kind of began to giggle because he was excited about it. He said, when I get to work, things aren't bad. He said, but if I keep my eyes open, God shows up again and again and again during the day. He said, when I go home, he said, I, th I, I share with my wife about the places that I saw God show up at work. And, and she shares with me the places that she saw God show up at work. She said, he said, and then guess what? God shows up there in our home because we're sharing with each other how God showed up during the day. He said, I don't know exactly how that works, but I'm glad that it does called life abundant life eternal and that's the life that that Jesus has for you and me it's not a so that life it's not a life that we seek him so that he can meet a particular need it's life life a life that's that's God breathed a life where the risen Christ meets us the same way that he did Mary there in the garden. And he asked her, whom do you seek? She wasn't seeking peace. 
She wasn't seeking bread. She wasn't seeking comfort. She only sought Jesus. And there, Mary, Mary was the first to see the risen Christ. He's available for those who have eyes to see, for you and for me. And it may be that that you've been wrestling during this time because you've been praying for a a so-that Jesus to come and, and meet the need that's immediate. That's okay. He doesn't get on folks for that, but there's more. There's more. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth and Jesus is the life that's available to, to you and me. It may be that um, when I began to talk about that, that what we seek makes a difference in the way that we see others, it may be that, that during this hard and this difficult time that you've been tempted to, to divide to divide everybody around you into enemies and allies and to isolate yourself. That's not a life that's eternal. That's not a life that's abundant. That's a life that breathes death in the here and now. It may be that when I began to talk about that what we seek makes a difference in the way that we see ourselves, that you've held on to something that someone else said about you. Maybe it was years ago, and you've been chasing it. That's not life. Life isn't after chasing after self-esteem or, or chasing after proving ourselves to others that what they said was wrong or what they said was right. Life, it comes in following Jesus Christ, our Savior. And the quality of this life is abundant. Even in a pandemic, the quality of this life, it's eternal. Even when death threatens us, The quality of this life is available to you and to me now, this day, and every day. And I want to pray with you now that you might receive it. Pray with me. Jesus, our nature, you know it, our nature is to seek. It's not always you that we seek after. Sometimes we seek after enemies and we find them when they're not there. We need your strength. Breathe the power, the power of a resurrected life, of eternal life, of abundant life on us this day. Jesus, you know that we have a a tendency to seek, to seek a, a name for ourselves, to seek to be well thought of, And these are the folks you had the most difficult time with. There's no life in it. Breathe the power of your Spirit on us today. That we might not seek for ourselves a name. To be highly esteemed. But that we might know not a proper, a positive self-image, but a proper self-image that, that you gave your life for us. And we're nothing, nothing more than sinners saved by grace and we're nothing less than your children. There's life in that. There's power in that. Breathe that power on us gathered here. Jesus, it may be that, that we've spent these anxious days looking seeking you so that, so that we might have comfort from loneliness, a break from worry, 
so that we might have healing. Those are not bad things, but you have more. Lord, you have a life that's abundant and eternal. A life that starts with you in a relationship this day. Breathe your breath on us and grant us grace enough to receive it. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. If you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.